All right, John 17. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. I appreciate you coming out. Somebody turn the air down, I think. It's a little stuffy in here. I don't know what the air is set on. Uh, we had a wedding yesterday. Uh, while he's doing that, we had a wedding yesterday. Our friends from Canada. Uh, and of course, I had to translate the whole wedding into Canadian. And I kept saying, do you take this lovely wife, eh, to be your wedded wife, eh? And he said, yeah, eh? I do. Of course I do, eh? No, they weren't like that. Uh, they, were, they were a joy to be with, and we enjoyed their company, and uh, I was... Uh, I was honored. I really was. I've done several weddings for people that have been associated uh, with our uh, ministry. Um, a couple of them here. There's been um, one or two of them. One I remember in particular where they, uh, they sent us plane tickets, Lisa and I, and uh, had us come all the way to Washington State to do a wedding uh, for them. And that was, that was fun. It really was. And I've even done or been at a couple of funerals for people who are in our ministry or have been in our part of our ministry years gone by. And uh, it is a joy to, uh, to be part of people's lives like that. And just for them spending time here and getting to know them, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was fun. The only thing I regret was we sent them to the Blue Owl to get their humongous atomic apple pie, and they're closed on Monday. Yes! They're not open at all on Monday. So they were not able to get the world-famous Blue Owl apple pie. For those of you watching online, you can type that in and you'll see it. It was on the Food Network. And when you walk in the restaurant, they have a video playing of that segment. I don't know when it was done, but it was showing how they make that apple pie. It's a great big... They have a great big Tupperware bowl. It looks like, I don't know, it looks like a bullet is what it does. It's a Tupperware dish. It looks like the papal tiara. I'm not kidding you. It's a big cone egg looking thing or a half egg. And they take um, pie crust and they put it all down inside that Tupperware bowl. And then they pour their apple pie filling in there and fill it all the way up. And then they turn it over real quick into a pie dish with um, pie dough already, pie crust already uh, there on the bottom. And remove the Tupperware. You don't want Tupperware melted all over your pie. And uh, then they bake it. And when it comes out, they drizzle caramel all over the top of it and pecans, roasted pecans. <sighs> And you get you a big dollop of ice cream on the side of that if you want. And buddy, oh, it's good. But they missed out. So anyway, it was a joy to have them and uh, we appreciate them. Um, so I appreciate y'all's prayers for me. I haven't been sleeping all that good. And um, the night before the wedding, I went to bed and I did not sleep at all. My legs were cramping real bad. And that lasted all the way into even last night. Um, I didn't get much sleep last night either. And uh, legs cramping an awful lot. And for I don't know what the reason. I, I've tried everything. People said, if you tried this, yes. If you tried that, yes. I've tried everything. And uh, they cramp no matter what. And so I appreciate everybody's prayers. Feeling a little bit better today. So ready to ready to get on with the word of God tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's thank God for bringing Michael back home. Mama Michael, are you glad to see your son? Yes, I bet you are. And uh, we're glad to have him back. So just pray for him that God will give him rest. All right. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for hearing our prayers uh, for our friend, our brother, our co-laborer in Christ. And Father, I thank you for Michael and all that he has done for your kingdom and um, for your name, for your word's sake. And Lord, there's, there's no, no telling how many people who at the end of time will be able to count in heaven the number of saints and souls that, whose lives have been touched by the labor, by the effort that we have put forth 
uh, in Kenya. And Lord, we ask you, Father, that you would allow us to continue that ministry and help us, dear God, to continue to be a blessing in that country. And Father, if your will be so, uh, to continue to be a blessing or start to be a blessing even outside of Kenya. And so, Father, we'll just follow your will wherever it takes us, wherever it leads. And Lord, I have learned, Father, that if we are in your will and we're doing what you've called us to do, uh, we're happy, we're blessed. There's rejoicing in the city as we learn from the book of Ruth or Esther. And uh, Father, we just ask God that you place each one of us individually in your will, doing what you've called us to do, and then place our church inside of your will and your desire uh, for what you want us to be doing as we serve you in these last days. Father, we pray, dear God, that you bless each and every one that is joined with us tonight. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would just give us a great blessing as we study your word, use it for uh, our edification, but your glory. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would hear the prayers of each one that is praying tonight. Father, that you would forgive sins. Lord, that you would heal people, that you would uh, bind, Father, those who are brokenhearted over one thing or another. And Lord, just be with sinners tonight as they call upon you and confess their sins. I pray, dear God, you would be faithful and have abundance of mercy upon each one of them. Father, I know what it's like to struggle with repentance and struggle and wonder whether or not my sins are actually forgiven. And Father, every time I struggle, I read your word and I find the answer there that you're a faithful God and you're a just God and you will forgive our sins of those, Lord, who call upon your name. So, Father, bless that tonight and bless us as we hear your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said... Amen. John chapter 17, I'm going to read uh, from verse 1 down. Uh, we'll stop at verse 10. That's what I have up on the screen tonight. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You know what? I'm, I'm going to do something tonight. I, I'm trying. I'm getting ahead of myself is what I'm doing. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking of what's in my notes coming up here. Um, I'm going to deal with this. I have underlined in that verse, verse 11. Jesus referring to God as Holy Father. There is only one anywhere who deserves the title of Holy Father, who rightfully has the title of Holy Father, and it's only used one time in Scripture. And I did a little survey, and I've been digging... Um, for a few weeks now into Catholic doctrine, uh, articles written by uh, pro-Catholics, articles written by priests, um, sermons that have been preached by Catholic priests and bishops, the, um, the language of the catechism and so on concerning Roman Catholics referring to the Pope as Holy Father. And out of all, and I, I know I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I want you to do this tonight. I noticed that in every apologetic that a, that a Catholic uses to promote the idea that the, the Pope has the right to be referred to as Holy Father, out of all the sources that they quote out of all the um, arguments that they give and out of all the scriptures that they say support them referring to their Pope as Holy Father, to my knowledge, no one, no Catholic source ever referenced John 17, 11. 
They left it out for some reason. They left, the, they never said, well, since the Pope is uh, the, the vicar of Christ on earth and Christ is the everlasting father, uh, Christ gave his father the title of Holy Father, therefore we give our... They left John 17, 11 out. It's almost like we don't want you to know that that verse is in there. And most Catholics will never know that. They don't read the Bible enough to ever know that that's in the Bible. It's like that lady I talked to about the Ten Commandments. She did not know what her Bible said about graven images. She had no idea what I was talking about. It's like I was from Mars reading her some strange Martian rule book. She had no idea. And I think most Catholics do not know the specialty that this title is and how holy it is to God and how it's only referenced God one time. So they completely ignore it. So here's what I want you to do. Let's say that, that everything that Jesus is praying now in John 17, he's praying to his Holy Father. Um, okay, it's not exactly in the middle of the chapter, John 17, but it's close. So everything that Jesus says before verse 11 and everything he says after verse 11, let's do this in our mind. Let's say that the reason why, and I'll, I'll just say it, the devil is the one who originated the idea for Catholics, priests, bishops, and so on to refer to the Pope as Holy Father. The devil is the one who came up with that. So let's just say now, as we're reading this in our mind, that what if all of these things that Jesus is saying about God and about what he's doing for God, let's, let's just imagine that all of these things now are being stolen by the Pope. Let me give you an example. Back in verse 1, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So in this case here, verse 1, they would be saying that the Pope is the one who glorifies Jesus Christ. A man. A man who is apparently so sinful that every Pope has his own confess confessional booth and a priest upon whom he confesses all of his sins. How would you like that job? How would you like to be one of these young Catholic men that has grown up believing that the, the Pope is the Holy Father, that he's the vicar of Christ, that he is God on this earth, and then you crawl into a booth with him and the Pope starts confessing to you about how he's dreaming about little boys. And you're going, Santa Papa? Okay. So just kind of put that in your mind. Verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Think about that as an attribute of the Pope. Verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And I'm going to lay, I'm going to lay a scriptural foundation for this if you want. But anyway, let me go back to where we started. Verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. And I, I listen, it is undoubtedly the Catholic Church glorifies the Pope throughout all the earth. He is magnified. He is uplifted. What he says goes. I read stuff from, I read stuff from Catholics all the time and they're all the time talking about uh, Pope Francis said this and Pope Francis said that. And last week when Pope Francis came out speak, standing in that snake's head, you remember that? The uh, papal, um, what do they call it? The papal hall where he comes out and gives his speech every Wednesday, his teaching every Wednesday, his homily. Okay. When he's speaking from the mouth of the serpent, they quote that all the time. Pope Francis said this. Pope Francis said that. Um, verse 5. And now, O Father, 
Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. Boy, what a statement by our Savior. I pray for them. I pray not, and this is Christ now being the mediator. I pray for them. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Think about that. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And this is part of that all things. We're going to look at that tonight. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep, and boy, think about this. Keep through thine own name. What is his own name? Holy Father. Those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And I'm going to jump ahead just for a minute. And say this, and we'll get to our notes here. In fact, I think I did a, a watchman deal on this here a while back. If, if it is Satan's idea, and I totally believe it is, to give the Pope the title Holy Father, and Jesus used that name, Holy Father, and then he said, keep through thine own name, which means the Holy Father. Keep through the name of the Holy Father, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Is Jesus interested in unifying the body of believers? The answer is yes, he is. That's clear in the scriptures. Now take this and apply it to what the Pope and what his agenda is. Is the Pope's agenda to unify not just the disciples of Christ, but all religions under the umbrella of the papacy. You believe that? You believe that the Pope is working hard, desperately. All the Popes, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 1st, John Paul the 2nd, uh, Benedict and now Francis have all worked, especially since the Second Vatican Council in 1963, they have all worked toward the idea of unification. Unification of nations and unification of religions. They've already got a lot of the European Protestant religions on their side. They've already got the Muslim community. Because Catholic statement after Catholic statement has affirmed that the Muslim believes in the same God that the Pope teaches and preaches about. Therefore, they are our brethren. So you're dealing with probably close to two and a half, three billion people in the world right now that are already under the papacy or the authority of the papacy whose leader is called the Holy Father. All right, now, let's go back to verse 7. There's that phrase, all things. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. And um, let's see here. It, uh, Jesus said earlier, where is it? Um... Oh, now I can't find it. Father, thou hast given him power of flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as... Okay, verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. When God gave the disciples and all the believers of Christ throughout history, past, present, future, into Jesus, that was part of the all things that God has given to his son, Jesus Christ. In other words, God has taken those whom he has called and he's put them under the direct authority of his son, 
who is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, under the authority of Jesus Christ. God trusts Jesus. He knows Jesus is not going to foul it up. He's not going to make mistakes. Uh, he's not going to take it and squander the kingdom and, and use it to, for his own gain and his own money or whatever. Use it to get women or whatever. He's going to be a faithful king to God. And so when God gave Christ all things, the church and all who believes in God are part of that. So he says again, verse 7, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. It started out as God the Father's, but now he has given it to his Son. Uh, Leviticus, let me read some verses here very quickly. Leviticus 8, 36. So Aaron and his sons did, there's the phrase, all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Now Leviticus is the book on the Levites and their sacrifices. In other words, when God gave Moses the law of sacrifices, Moses was faithful to write all of those laws down. And then he commanded Aaron, Aaron, you see what I got written here? You and your sons and all these Levite priests, you, you're going to do exactly what is written in here. We're going we're gonna to practice this. And we're going to get it right when people bring in this kind of sacrifice, that kind of sacrifice. Here's what we're going to do to it. We're going to do it exactly according to the book. You don't get to make it up as you go say amen. And that seems to be the idea uh, behind what has literally destroyed American Christianity. Is that too many pastors, music ministers, youth ministers... Church members have decided that it doesn't matter what you do to praise God or to worship God or to serve God as long as you do something. Well, that's not necessarily true. Are there wrong ways in being in disobedience in your attempt to serve God? Yes. Absolutely yes. And so God wrote down rules and he said, Moses, show this to Aaron, show it to all the Levites that when they, when people bring in sacrifices, they're to do exactly this, the way it is written. So that when Moses died and Aaron died, by the way, did Aaron, let me ask our young people, did Aaron Make it into the promised land with Joshua. Jaden? He says no. Hope? JR? Nope. Okay. Three nopes? One very innocent? Yes. The nopes have it. He died before Moses did. Okay. Uh, because his sons offered strange fire. He allowed it. But anyway, so even though Aaron has died, even though his sons offered strange fire, so the priesthood is going to go to a different line in the Levite tribe. Moses died before they ever got into Canaan land, but they're carrying the, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. They're going to put it in Shiloh. When they get to Shiloh, somebody's going to need to know how to do these sacrifices. They have it written, all things that they're to do, they have it written in a book so that they can do all things. John 3, 35, the father loved the son and hath given all things into his hand. What about the moon? Is the moon to belong to Jesus? Huh? All things. Well, doesn't it belong to Neil Armstrong? I mean, he's the one who first put his foot on it. So doesn't he own it? Put the American flag. There's no Russian flag, Chinese. There's no, there's no other flag on the moon except ours. Don't we own it, United States? No. God and God alone owns it. Okay? So has given all things into his hand. He owns the moon. He owns the sun. He owns all the planets, all the stars, all the universe. He owns everything you have, everything I have. We're just borrowing it for the 
termination of our life. We're just borrowing it. John 13, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. In this case, the all things refers to the fact that God now, he's called upon Jesus to, number one, be the high priest, number two, to be the lamb, number three, to offer the blood, number four, to provide the blood, and so on and so on. Everything that was going to happen before this point, but definitely from this point forward, God had now given that. He, it's like, uh, well, I'll explain it like my DNA, okay? My DNA... When I was uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 18, 19 years old, my DNA said, my is going to have a real thick head of brown hair. Fur-like, all right? But then, years down the road, my DNA said, uh, we've got some uh, genes here that are coming from the Corzine side of the family. How much hair does Uncle John have left, Matthew? Very little. He actually had gray hair by, by 16. Okay, so if any of you kids get start getting gray hair early, it's Corzine, okay? So anyway, when my head started letting loose of some of that hair, my peepaw all the way through his life up until his death had thick hair so i know it's not his fault my dad had thick hair ain't his fault got it from my mama's side so my dna said at a certain age that i'm going to start losing some of this protection i have against the sun okay and i've lost it trust me and so everything happens at its time so when god gave all things into jesus hand did that mean at that time that Jesus was in fact going to enact everything that's in the Bible for him to do? No. No. At this time, he's only to do what is necessary for this Passover and his crucifixion. His, after that, he's going to go to the lower parts of the earth, preach the spirits in prison. Then he's going to rise from the dead and he's going to be on the earth and then he is going to give instructions to his disciples and then the cloud is going to pick him up and take him into heaven and boom, he's going to do those things that have been given to him and he did every single one of them. Is there anything that Jesus left out that he should have fulfilled that was written before time in prophecy? No, he fulfilled everything. And I'll give you something to think about when you think about how accurate the Bible is. Okay? Um, for the Roman soldiers to take Jesus' garment and remove it from him and cast lots for it on the day of Calvary, day of the crucifixion, when it was prophesied by David a thousand years before it would be like you taking uh, the most powerful gun that you have, going out into your front yard, shooting it up in the air, and have the arc and the 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 amount of gunpowder that powder that you needed, keeping in mind the position of the earth and the sun and how the winds are blowing that day in such a way so that a thousand years later, one of your offspring, whoever that's going to be, you've left it in your will that on a thousand years from this date, you want one of your great, 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 great grandsons, whose name is going to be Nermal, Nermal X2, let's be his name, and Nermal X2 is going to take a target and walk around in your front yard and hold it up on this exact time and it's going to hit the bullseye a thousand years later. 
That's, that's the probability of the Bible predicting something like the Roman soldiers taking the garment of Jesus off and casting lots for it. I mean, you might say, well, Jesus said, you know, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that was in Psalm 2. That was written a thousand years before Christ. Yeah, but you might say, well, Jesus read that and he said that so it could make it look like he was fulfilling scripture. A self-fulfilling prophecy, in other words. But not the fact that they pierced his hands and feet. Not the fact that they mocked him. Not the fact that they said, come down from there. Not the fact that they parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture. Just one of those. Just one of those. The odds are astronomical of that event happening exactly to the letter the way God said it would. And yet the Old Testament is full of those prophecies. I mean, here's Isaiah saying, and by his stripes we are healed. How did Isaiah know that they were going to take a scourge and put stripes on Jesus' back? How did Isaiah know that? How did the prophet know that Jesus was going to be betrayed by someone in his own group? Okay, I was wounded in the house. Of my, what, what, what was it the Bible said? What are these wounds in thy hands? See, that's a second prophecy about piercing Jesus' hands and feet. How did they know that? God put it in there. So anyway, let me move on. Um, so the all things that were given into Jesus' hands at this time were fulfilled at this time, and he fulfilled every single one of them. Now Revelation 5 is what I like to call the book of all things. Some people have heard this. Uh, some people may not have. And even if you have heard it, it doesn't hurt us to go back and relook at it, does it? Um, I got a blessing Monday. Uh, I came in and I said, God, uh, show me something to read this morning. Show me something that will really catch my interest. And uh, show me something cool. And so I won't tell you what it is. Well, I will tell you part of it. I found the symbols of the Communist Party in the scriptures within like four verses of each other. And you, when you start to understand the significance of it, you, you're like, oh. okay? So I had this big smile on my face Monday. Man, that's so neat. So, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. Uh, Revelation chapter, but this chapter, I had read and studied this chapter that I, that I was, uh, that I got that from, um, 20 some odd years ago. And it really, God used it to lay a foundation of some understanding for me and the way my mind works. Sometimes I'll, I'll think about maybe go back and read that again. And I'm saying, well, I've already found what I found, what I needed to find out of that chapter. So I'm just going to skip it. I do that all the time and it's stupid. Go back and read it again because there's things in there you missed. I guarantee you. Uh, Revelation chapter five. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. So maybe tonight, tomorrow, you can get the pure Bible search software and study the word book or books. All throughout the Bible. Read every one of them. Study them out. A, a book written within and on the back side. Sealed with seven seals. Uh, DNA, of course, is a book. And DNA is actually written uh, literally on both sides. It is. If you take DNA and split it in half, because of the rules of DNA, you have as much information from one strand or one leg of the DNA, RNA, as you do on the other. And uh, what's really interesting is that the two legs of DNA 
One of them is called five prime and one of them is called three prime. And I still haven't understood what that is. I just know um, Donna, the software lady, pointed this out to me. It has to do with the way it's read. Uh, five prime, let's say it's read this direction and three prime is read in this direction. Now, when you think of that as the Old and New Testament, are the Testaments written in two different directions? Yeah, Hebrew is written from right to left and Greek is written from left to right, just like DNA. Five prime is written this way or read this way and three prime is written or read that way. That's cool! On a throne, a book written within on the backside, sealed with seven seals. The book that the two tables of law that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with were written on both sides, both sides, just like this book. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor in earth nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Keep that in mind, because as I said, Monday I came in here, I didn't know what to read. God referred me to a place. My nature wanted to say, I've already read that. But then I remembered, Mike, when's the last time you have read that? Well, it's been years and years and years. So I said, okay, God, I'll read it. And I read one chapter and I'm, I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. I learned some new things there. But then I read the next chapter and when I saw that, I went, I'll be. That's pretty cool. So I can't take credit for that. I can't. Only Jesus is the one who is worthy to open that book and to loose what's in it. Because if he doesn't open it up to your mind, you will never be affected by it. We pray for people, for them to be saved. We try to give them Bible verses. We try to give them, uh, I argued with somebody today and I gave Bible verses after Bible verses and it had no effect whatsoever. And uh, I, I hate to say uh, anything about anybody when it relates to salvation, but uh, it was clear to me that at least on this issue that he and I were talking about, God has not opened up the book to his mind yet, because if he had it, he wouldn't be believing any of the things that he was led to believe. That in itself is something to think about. If there's something in the Bible that God or if the major things of the word of God are being withheld from you or somebody that you know, that is something for you to get along with God about and say, God, why are you hiding your word from me? God, why will you not open up your words to me? God, I'm reading the Bible and I'm get, it's not making a change in my life. It's not affecting me. It's not, not doing anything for me. And I, I personally, I know that feeling. So if you're in a place where you know that God has closed the book on you, I think I'd be down on my knees fasting and praying saying, God, open that book. Uh, verse four, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. There, I never will be. You've never will be. Neither to look thereon. We don't even have the, we don't even have the ability to see it. And one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and, and that of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. I, I just thought of this, but I think it's interesting. Um, I'll have to think of the ramifications of it. But this deal about Jesus having seven horns. How many horns does the beast have? Huh? Ten. Ten. Uh, and, the, and the dragon has ten horns. I think there is a significant difference. 
Um, why the difference? And because the m- numbers mean two different things. But anyway, uh, verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne with the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. And that's also interesting to me that when John sees the beast, one of the heads was uh, wounded. It had been slain. And that deadly wound then is going to be healed. He's go- that is going to be resurrected. Christ has is the lamb who has been slain, but is alive. Jesus said it, I think, at the very beginning. I am he who was dead and alive and am alive forevermore. Um, but anyway, his seven horns and his seven eyes represent or are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So the seven locks that Samson had on his head, they are like the seven horns of the lamb, and they represent the Holy Spirit. And when Samson had his locks shaved off, did he have any power? Did he have the Spirit of God on him? No. It wasn't until his hair started growing back that God's power came back on him. That hair in the seven locks represented the seven spirits of God. God said, it is not by might, neither by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Samson himself did not have, I mean, Samson, we picture Samson as this big, burly, muscle, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger guy with these bulging, rippling muscles sticking out. Shoot. Samson could have been skinny like... John up there, tall and skinny, no meat, but his power came from God. Amen? That's what I like. Now, verse uh, 7, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. This is Jesus receiving all things. It's been given into his hands. Okay, now, now, now that I have all things in my hands, I can do these things, all right? Nehemiah chapter 8, I like this. Turn there, turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. Or Nehemiah, if you so inclined. Nehemiah. Job, Palms, Levititus, and Nehemiah. I did hear a little kid uh, when I was in uh, in church, when I was in Bible college, uh, we were trying to teach them the books of the Bible and their Sunday school teacher had done a pretty good job. So they got up during the service one time and was reciting the books of the Old Testament. And this boy, he had a section of it. And I can't remember what he said, but he said, um, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, is there any my uh, Esther? He, but he said Nehemiah. That's where I got it from. I got tickled at it. Nehemiah chapter eight, verse one. And all the people. Here's a picture now of Christ receiving all things. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man. This is a prophecy now. When we see God's people gathered together as one man, it is a prophecy of the day when Christ is going to unite all of us together. To make his body. Think about it. Your body. This this will blow your mind. Your skin. Is. um, Very tough. Not totally unbreakable. But not easily broken open. Part of your body. It is the largest organ of your body. Your skin. Your skin basically represents one whole entire system. Does that make sense to everybody? And yet, we know for a fact that the skin is merely made up of individual cells. And we also know that there is a inconceivable yet deliberate gap between every one of those cells. How is it that the cells of my skin don't just fall off all the time and my skin just come off? That would be gross if it happened right here in front of everybody. 
You've lost your skin, Pastor Mike. What? How is that happened? How is that possible? How is it possible that each one of us are as different and unique as each other is to each other, and yet we represent the whole of the body of Christ? How is that possible that we don't just all fall apart? It's because by Him, all things were created, and by Him, all things consist. Jesus Christ is the one that's holding everything together. Every cell in my body is being... Every, every, we know there's spaces between atoms. Every atom that makes up the molecules and cells in my body, there are spaces between those atoms. And yet, how is it that they're not penetrable? How is that? Christ is holding them together. So it's all done by the book. So in verse 1 again, they spake unto Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. That's a good church service. Amen. From morning till noon before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah. Let's count these. Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maasiah on his right hand. So we got six on his right hand. On his left hand, Padiah, Hiel, Malchiah, and Hashem, and Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Now, how many do we have on the left hand? Seven. How many are up there total? Huh? Fourteen. Ezra's with this side. He's number seven. So we got seven here, seven here, 14 together. And Ezra, look at it, verse 5, what did he do? Open the book. And what was he doing here? Because up to this point, none of the Jews knew the law. None of them did. So in order to initiate the proper worship of God, it had to come from the book. And who was the only one at this time worthy to take and open the book? It was Ezra, who's the type of Christ. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. And watch this. I like this. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. He didn't have to say, let us all stand for the reading of God's word. He didn't have to say that. When he opened it, they stood. Listen, that's reverence. We used to be a people that revered Certain things. When a lady walked into a room, what did men do? Stood up. When men walked into a building, what was the first thing they did? Take off their hats. Um, did women curse? <laughs> no. Uh, men didn't curse around women. They didn't curse around children. There was just a lot of things that used to be in this country that aren't anymore. That doesn't make them right. It's just the way it is. But these people, at the moment, Ezra, all he did was open it and they stood up. In verse uh, 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and the people answered, Amen. He hadn't even read it yet, and they're saying, Amen, Amen. Would, you ever want to bless me some Sunday when I'm down? It's before I ever get up to preach, come up and see Brother Mike, amen, amen. That means I'm agreeing with you preaching before you even preach it. And I'll go, thank you. Amen, amen, with lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So this is a prophecy. What do you think is going to happen when Jesus himself takes the book and he begins to loose the seals? God's people are going to rise up and say, Amen! Amen! You know why? 
because we're getting ready to go. Amen to that.